Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> hi, I'm Mark Platt, uh, fortunate enough to be one of the producers of Mary Poppins Returns, but really excited, actually, that I get to ask some questions of this illustrious group. Let me introduce them really quickly. Rob Marshall, director of Mary Poppins Returns. Emily Blunt, playing Mary Poppins. Lin-Manuel Miranda. Emily Mortimer, Ben Wishaw, producer John DeLuca, composer Mark Shaman, lyricist Scott Whitman, and screenwriter David McGee. Let's have a round of applause for this auspicious group. I'm going to start with you, Rob. First question is, why Mary Poppins Returns? Gosh. Um, thank you, Mark. And he's an extraordinary producer. Can I just say that right now? Um, you know what I thought to myself when this came our way, my way? Um, if anybody's going to do it, I would like to do it because I, it, it, it was incredibly daunting at first, of course, but at the same time, I really felt like I have that film, as many of us on this panel do, in our blood. And I wanted to be able to, in, a, in an odd way, protect the first film and treat this film with great care and love. And, you know, Musicals are, 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 are very difficult to do. An original musical, there's so many layers to it. But with this one, you know, creating an original musical from scratch was actually, for me, a dream. And I'd never done it before. And to be able to create it with this beautiful company was exactly what I was hoping for. And I, I have to say the guiding message of this film about finding light in the darkness is honestly what drew me to it and kept guiding me throughout the whole process, including till this very moment, you know, when people are actually now seeing the film. Because it feels so current to me that, and, and I'm just speaking for myself, but I, I, I feel people need this film now. And I, and I certainly knew that I wanted to live in that world and be part of that. And sending that message out into the world now of looking for hope and light in a dark time. And that's why we set our film in the in the Depression era in London, the time of the books. Um, it was it was really so it could feel accessible and feel like it's a, a story that needs to be told now. Rob, you said this is your most personal film. Why is that? It's a life choice, I guess. You have to you have to get up and approach your life in a in a certain way, and to look at it from the angle from a different point of view, which is in our film too. Um, from the point of view of looking for the light. Um, it's in the P.L. Travers books. It's, it's about finding that childlike joy in life, which might sound trivial to some, but for, to me, it's very profound. And I, and, and I honestly was able to explore that idea in making this film. It was incredibly hard work, probably the hardest work I've ever had to do on a film, but at the same exact time, incredibly joyous for that very reason. Emily, Emily, Emily. So <laughs> um, how did this come about for you? I think you even called my agent and said, something big's coming down the pipe for, you, for, for, for Emily. And, and then I got a, a um, voicemail from Rob, who is my dear friend, and we have known each other a long time. And the voicemail certainly had a sort of charged energy to it. Like I was like, oh my God, what is it? You know, what is this project? And um, and when he called me, you know, because y he is so beautifully ceremonious and wants every moment of the process to feel special and transporting and memorable for you, that even the phone call had such a sense of ceremony to it. And, um, and he said, you know, we've been digging through the Disney archives and, you know, we've been, and by far their most prized possession. And I was like, what? What is that? And I couldn't think like what it was, you know. And when you said Mary Poppins, I felt like the air changed in the room. It was so extraordinary, such an extraordinary, rather unparalleled moment for me because I f was filled with, uh, with an instantaneous yes, but also with some trepidation, you know, all happening simultaneously in that moment because she is so iconic. She she had such a big imprint on my life and, and and on everyone's lives you know she people hold this character so close to their hearts um and so you know how do i create my version of her what will my version of her be because there's no point no one wants to see me do a sort of cheap impersonation of julie andrews <laughs> because no one 
is Julie Andrews. And so she should be preserved and treasured in, in her own way of what she did. And so I knew this was going to be um, something that I wanted to take a big swing with. And I knew I could do it with this man, who is the most emboldening, meticulous, brilliant director in the world. And, um, and I was in safe hands with him, however much I knew I had my work cut out for me. And, and can I just add one quick thing, that there is not another person on this planet who could have played that part but you. No one. What did you draw upon? How, where did it come from? To, what, to all the different colors that you painted with this character because she's complicated and nuanced and it's such a sophisticated performance. Where did you find it all? She leapt off the page at me just in how complicated she is, how unknowable she is in this wonderful way. That duality of the character, you know, that she's... She is stern and she is incredibly rude, you know, and vain and, but like funny, you know, and, and yet there is this humanity and she has to herself have such a childlike wonder in her in order to want to infuse these children's lives with it. And, and there must under there be a generosity of spirit to want to fix and heal in the way that she does, you know, so... I think for me, and certainly for Rob, when we talked about it in the you know year and a half we spent before we even started rehearsing, you know, we would talk about her so much, and and we both wanted to find those those layers and those moments of humanity, um, and also the fact that she's probably a bit of an adrenaline junkie. Like she loves these adventures. It's it's like her her outlet, you know. Um, so just finding those moments so she's not just one thing, you know, because she is so enigmatic and. It was the great, such a delicious character to play. Loved it. Lynn, so uh, renowned for Broadway. Um, I remember seeing you the first time in In the Heights and, and, and watching you burst forth on stage. Here's your first big movie experience. How did it come about and how was the experience? When I got a call from uh, Rob Marshall and John DeLuca, we, we'd like to talk to you about something. Um, that became an immediate priority. And they said, uh, sequel to Mary Poppins. And I said, who's playing Mary Poppins? Uh, and they said, Emily Blunt. And I said, oh, that's good. <laughs> um, and, and, and honestly, I can't, I can't give them enough credit for seeing this role in me because uh, when I'm playing Hamilton, I mean, there's no childlike wonder in Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> uh, he, he has a very traumatic early life. He goes on that stage and he wants to devour the world and he wants to move so fast and he wants to do everything. Whereas Jack, in this movie, as they pitched him to me, has this childlike sense of wonder. He has this, um, you know, he's, he's in touch with that imagination you all see in your kids when they can sort of play in their own imagination for hours. Jack sort of never lost that. Um, and, and that was, um, I feel so humbled that he saw that in me. And then, you know, it, was, it came along at the perfect time for my family too. You know, we had finished a year of performing Hamilton and then I chopped my hair off and left the country and jumped into <laughs> Mary Poppins' universe. It was like beautiful. And your favorite part of making the film or favorite experience in the film? There are so many. I mean, you've seen the film. There are a lot of highs on a movie like this. Um, and coming from the theater where you're, you're, the only thing that changes in the performance is the audience and your energy that day to go, okay, Thursday we'll be shutting down Buckingham Palace and riding with 500 bicyclists. And Friday you'll be, you know, dancing with the penguins. Um, you know, those kind of, of moments are, are really sort of unforgettable. But for me, um, I brought my son to set every time we filmed a musical number. Uh, and to watch his eyes like saucers while daddy danced with you know, what seems like 500 dancers and bikers. I'll never forget the look on his face as long as I live. Emily Mortimer, I remember in the making of the film, we had a lot of logistical challenges to get you back and forth for your family, but you seemed undaunted and so determined to participate in this movie. And of course, your work is so quite lovely in it. Just your, your feeling stepping into the shoes of a, of a character that was a child, the world knows, is now grown up and, and the experience of being in a musical film as opposed to, to a drama. I've got so many things to say. Um, uh, I, I felt from the minute that I met Rob that I wanted to be part of this film. Um, I, of course, Mary Poppins was a huge part of my childhood as it 
as it is of everybody's. Um, but it was really, and, and, and it was exciting to think that, that, that they were going to make another movie of it, but, and, and daunting too, obviously. But it was meeting Rob and hearing him talk like he has just now about why he so was so determined to make this film and uh, that just really inspired me. Um, and, and, um, and, I, and, and, and that doesn't often happen. And, when, and I've, I'm quite old now and I've done a lot of movies <laughs> and I know enough about life to know, um, or, or life as an actor or performer or whatever, to know that when somebody inspires you and makes you excited, uh, about the idea of a, of a movie or a project or whatever, it's it's a rare thing, and and you just have to go with it. You just have to try to jump on that train if you can. And so I I emerged from meeting Rob and John and and, and rang up my agents immediately and said I just have to be part of this movie no matter what. I just want to be in it. I just want to be help Rob tell this story. It just felt like incredible good fortune every time I walked on the set to be there and. Um, and as Lynn said, just every single moment was was magical. It was like sort of intravenous entertainment. It was almost dangerous. <laughs> um, it was almost too much at times. Um, and um, and and getting to know Ben and having that friendship was immediate and so sweet. And it was just ma it was the whole thing was 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 magical and um, and and something I'll treasure forever. And. Uh, I feel very lucky to have been a part of. And as to the bit about how to do this part, um, I don't know really, I don't know really, it was, it, it was like Rob, it was a sleight of hand of Rob's where he is the puppet master and he's absolutely kind of Mary Poppins himself. Like it, it's a stealth, he is Mary Poppins. It's a, he's Mary Poppins without the parrot. Um, but he's, he's like, you just sort of know what to do without having to worry about it too much and he's, protecting you from all the anxiety and the, the sort of stress of the burden of knowing that this is this is such a huge thing and this is such a huge um, you know legacy and we're in charge of it and he does this none of that came into it it was just we've got to just do this we've got to have fun doing this we've got to do right by this in the best sweetest way and it was just a, a joy you know there's a lovely easter egg in the film there are many easter eggs in the film and one of them of course is a is a cameo by karen dotris who played the original jane what was that like meeting her and in, in, in that moment it was extraordinary she's such a great cool lady so funny wicked sense of humor really down to earth and and ballsy and she she came she came to do the cameo in the there's a little moment where ben's emerging from the house with his briefcase late and he bumps into her and we all walked onto the set for the first time with her and um she walked onto cherry tree lane for the first time in 54 years or however long it is since the uh, first movie was made and and she just melted. I mean, she just sort of it crumbled. And uh, it was so moving being there with her while that happened and seeing that. We were fortunate to have a number of those kind of experiences. Just really quickly, maybe just real quick about what it was like having Dick Van Dyke and what he said and how he came onto the set. I mean, every one of us was there. And it was beyond. I don't think any of us could even breathe that day because we couldn't believe that we were touching that and he was basically playing the same old banker that he played he grabbed my hand as we walked onto the set and he turned to me and he said something i will never forget he said i feel the same spirit here on this set that i did in the first film and that was you know that was the dream come true right there i was so moved when um my favorite moment on the set of the whole of the whole filming was when a after dick did his monologue uh, to the kids in the bank, Rob, we're all waiting for Rob to call cut, and he because he was waiting quite a long time, and and then I, he, he couldn't because of all the emotion. He was crying, and he couldn't literally say the word, and it was and just realizing that was so so touching. I think Emily called cut because I <laughs> <laughs> or said it's bossy, over. yeah. <laughs> Dear Ben Wishaw, so Ben, uh, similarly, you, you had the, um, you're playing a character now grown up, but sort of so iconic as a little boy. It was the balancing act, do you mind if I just jump in? It was the balancing act of the whole film and the creation of the film the entire time. That's what we were doing. I really felt that everyone who was a part of this needed to have the first film in their blood in some way, because that's what we were following. 
And so we were looking for that balance throughout the entire time we were working on this film. And, you know, I, I use myself as a barometer, I have to say, because I thought, well, if, if, you know, what would I want to see? I would want to, if I came to a sequel to Mary Poppins, I would want to see an animation sequence with live action. And I would want it to be hand drawn and, and a 2D world. I would want to see that. I would, want it, I would want Cherry Tree Lane to have a curve to it because that's the Cherry Tree Lane we all know. I would feel disappointed if it was a straight street. I mean, it was as simple as that. Although we were finding our new way, there were things, there were sort of goalposts or signposts throughout that we needed to hold on to because it's in the DNA of the material. I knew there needed to be, John and I really wanted a big, huge production number that, that Mark and Scott wrote so beautifully uh, with, uh, with uh, athletic dancers, men with Mary and Jack, Jack leading the entire piece. That needed to be in there in some way. I would feel that if it wasn't there, we've gone off track. So it was a way of, it was this insane balancing act of, of, of honoring the first film, but at the same time forging our own way, our own story. Setting it in the 30s helped that. Having Michael and Jane grown up and seeing what's happened to them and how that and what and their journey and and the, the, what they've lost along the way helped that, but it was it was constantly back and forth. And I have to say, I just used my own gut about what needed to be there, what we needed to reflect, pay homage. <clears throat> Mark and Scott were incredibly careful uh, about making sure that. We didn't abuse using themes from the first film. It's so easy to use. We used it in very strategic places throughout the film. Most of it actually very much at the end where we feel we'd earned it by then. And that's what Mark was very careful about doing. So, but it was all that. I feel like you know the whole time it was that. But I did feel that we were coming from the right place. And that was the key. I just wanted to ask, actually, I'm particularly love that this is a musical. And because it's a musical, I feel that the heart of the film is really where the lost things go. And I really would love to know like, where the inception and thought for that came from. And then also from Emily, how did it feel like singing that on set? Well, well the song came from, in one of the books, Mary's uncle is the man in the moon. And um, she takes the children there to a tea for a tea party, but on the other side of the moon, he tells her this is where the things that people can't find live. It's the dark side of the moon, and not in the Pink Floyd way. But, uh, but <coughs> although and you so that line that up with our movie, it works <laughs> that seemed perfect. to be a good metaphor for for loss to do for her to sing to the children. And we, so. you know, we had to find a way for her to sing about loss to the children in a ways that they can comprehend, and the song doesn't actually speak of their mother until the final verse, until she feels like they're really getting it. Uh, and then to get to hear Emily sing it, <laughs> I mean, she would come to our apartment where we have a studio, and it was just, you know, magical to hear her do it. And We got to bes bespoke it on yeah. her. <laughs> what was that like to sing? And another thing, and here's the thing about what Rob is so brilliant at, is getting from scene to song. I mean, it's, it's almost a backhanded compliment because there's not many people out there even trying to do it now, but with the small handful there are, no one does it like he does. And that song in particular, you're like, oh, she, she's singing a song. And, and all that on-set live singing too must have just been terrifying. And yet with Emily Blunt, nothing ever seems terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, I mean, I, I remember those early days of coming to your apartment and singing that song, and I was so incredibly moved by it that I found it virtually impossible to get through it the first few times I sang it in your apartment. It was, it was so emotional for me. Um, because I did think of my own children and, and these children in the film and their sense of loss and that they're trying to hold their father together and they've they've dealt with something so profound and so um, agonizing, you know, to lose a parent and to be so young and miss her so much. And, oh my God, I like cry thinking about it. But it was just, it, it, it just moved me so much. And so um, on the day, I love, it was one of my favorite days on set and we shot that song all day, I think a couple of days. Um, because it is, it is that she recognizes what they need in that moment and 
gives it to them in this very tender way and um and this the song is is so true and she doesn't um shy away from the fact that they've lost something but that there's cracks of light you know and there's and there's something to learn from and the idea of loss being something that they can digest as children and not and uh, and to walk through you know that sh you are going to walk through this loss but that nothing's gone forever only out of place is just such a hopeful way to look at loss mm -hmm. really do we have time for one or two more yes sir i have to imagine there's an incredible inherent pressure playing the role of mary poppins how do you balance julie andrews extraordinary performance with the P.L. Travers version in the books while adding your own personal signature as well? Um, I think um, for me, what I, what I decided to do was, was, even though I'd seen it as a child, was, was not watch the original um, so close to shooting our version. Um, because I think, probably because she is so beautiful and so extraordinary in it, you know, I think I would have maybe tried to I don't know, try and accommodate in some way, you know, in some bigger way what she did um, and and um, let that sort of bleed into what I wanted to do. And so I just decided if I'm going to do this, I'm just going to go on my gut instinct from the book because she is rather different in the in in all of the books, you know, and um, that was the decision really is just to if I was going to carve out new space for myself. It was gonna have to be um, without watching Ju the details of what Julie did so close to shooting. I mean, I have this searing memory of Mary Poppins, um, but not of all of the tiny details of how she played the character. And so as soon as we wrapped, I watched the original and was just floored by it. You know, I'm probably relieved that I hadn't watched it because I think I was like, oh my gosh, she's amazing, you know. Um, and I showed my daughter it, you know. Let's take one more question, and then we're going to have to to wrap up. I want to go back. Yeah, sir, over there. Yeah. Uh, well, for Rob and any of the filmmakers who can speak to it also, the visual effects of the original Mary Poppins were groundbreaking at the time. And of course, now audiences have seen everything a computer can do. So how did you want to design those sequences? Like you mentioned, you wanted an, an animated sequence again. Uh, so that it was retro enough to fit Mary Poppins and yet still uh, carved new territory. I mean, I, I try as much as I can to do it as real as possible, and that's why I was so anxious and excited to shoot on location. I mean, Lynn drives by St. Paul's. That is St. Paul's Cathedral. And, and, of course, in the first film, it's that beautiful Peter Ellenshaw painting. But... Because we were setting this in the 30s in a more real time, I really loved the juxtaposition between the real world that we were shooting and in this real family. I wanted you to really connect emotionally to these people and know that they were real. And then these fantasias that, and adventures that Mary Poppins takes them on, then we can go so many places and come back to this real world. And the hope for me was that by the end of the film, they combine, they collide. But it was really sort of, Finding that real world and then these two different worlds—that was that—that that was uh, you know that was actually the the plan. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. May Mary Thanks Guys so returns. It's been such a joyous experience for us. We hope it has been for you as well. So thank you all so much. <laughs>